which everybody here, not everybody, but some of you at least, are old enough to remember. It was like yesterday, right? <laughs> the 50s. The, um, so let's, let's consider this historically, sense of historical perspective, if we may. Um, American Jewry in 1952 to 56 is the largest in the world. It's a lot bigger than Israel. Only very recently has Israel overtaken American Jewry. You know, the, I know in this crowd you, you follow the numbers. That's, that's brand new. We're living through a, a demographic revolution. Uh, it's actually the Zionist dream that Israel, that the Jewish people should be normal and that the largest, just like most Irishmen live in Ireland, the most Englishmen live in England, most Jews live in Israel. And that's not exactly true yet because a majority of the Jewish people that is not living in Israel. But still, the fact that it's the largest community has always removed the anomaly that America was much bigger. In the years I'm talking about, in the 50s, the American Jew was, was 10 times the size, oh, you know, five times the size of Israel. So consider that. Uh, that's interesting. So right off the bat, when we're talking about American Jewry. It's a very uh, a numerically uh, large uh, um, uh, phenomenon, and it's the most prosperous by far. Israel is broke and poor, as we talked about. This is the era of the Ma'abara. In other parts of the world, perhaps with the exception of South Africa, the Jews are recovering from the Holocaust or from the effects of the war and trying to make the economy get better. The countries themselves are going through difficult times. The 40s and the 50s is the recovery years. But uh, to give you an example of what I'm talking about, until 1953, think about this. In Great Britain, it's still rationing. The bread is rationed. Uh, it's crazy, right? Uh, the war's over a long time ago. The effects were pretty strong, but not in America. So it's the most prosperous Jewish community in the world. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, American Jews, like Americans in general, made nice money during the war because of the mobilization of the economy, the defense efforts, and all that sort of thing. By 1952, when we begin, um, the U.S. has taken in 137,000 refugees after the war, known as uh, Holocaust uh, uh, survivors, uh, thanks to Truman, because the quotas were still there and were not revoked until the 60s under LBJ. And according to the law, they shouldn't be able to get in. And particularly when, according to the strict letter of the law, you have to come in and be able to be self-supporting and all that sort of thing. And you tell me somebody's coming from, from the DP camps. I mean, they have no physical means of support. And in spite of that, Truman pushed the Congress all during his uh, seven and a half years, I might say. This is not often acknowledged, that they should uh, ease up on this and let in the refugees a special situation. Not only Jewish, but people from Europe in general. And Congress, once in a while, in 47, 48, and later on 51, you know, under presidential pressure, let in a few thousand here, 50,000 here, 100,000 there, like that. And, this, and, and the majority of the people came in were not Jewish. But 140,000 come in that are Jewish. So you have the largest Jewish community in the world increased their numbers by close to 150,000 as a result of what I just described. Uh, I might point out that the, the uh, Jewish Jews in the United States in the years I'm talking about are the freest Jews in the world, okay? They are uh, certainly freer than in Israel and Russia for different reasons. Obviously in Russia, nobody's free. In Israel, it's the Ben-Gurion years, the government was pretty doggone authoritarian. Um, they told you where you get a house and what kind of job you're gonna get and how much food you're gonna get and if you don't like it, tough luck, which is precisely the reason why a lot of Jews from the West did not wanna move over there at that time. Today, it's a lot freer. Um, this is the early years of the command economy, of the socialist economy, um, of what a famous Israeli sociologist in his a book he published in 1952 called The Totalitarian Democracy, a very famous uh, book by Israeli professor in, from the Hebrew University of 52. Um, and it's not the case in the United States of America. Right? Here it's a free, free, free. I might point out also that American Jewry is the most powerful Jewish community in the world. Far more powerful in the state of Israel, even though you might think it's a certain anomaly, it's a different situation, but everybody here knows exactly what I'm talking about. The um, Israel survived then and survives even until today for a variety of reasons. Now I'm talking about Bader HaTeva, but for a variety of reasons. And one of the most important factors is uh, the support of the American Jewish community, which has its big influence on the United States government, and the United States has been the superpower since the end of the Second World War. And so the fact that you have uh, such a gigantic uh, engine out there in international affairs uh, backing Israel very often against the entire world. You, I know you follow the news. Uh, how many times is it 
that in, in the United Nations vote, it's Israel, the U.S., and Micronesia <laughs> versus everybody else. True, but true or not, it, it, it's not funny. And how many times is it that you know the Security Council, the other is going to vote to wipe out Israel, is vetoed by the U.S. Sometimes the U.S. likes to veto it. Usually they don't, but they do it anyway. And so, even though, on, according to classical Zionism, if you ask him, the American Jews are being protected by the fact that there's Israel. But you've all seen those T-shirts, you know, America, don't worry, Israel's out, out there to protect you or will save you. But that's a joke. It's the other way around. Especially in the years we're talking about, without the millions of dollars sent by the American Jews, and without the millions of dollars that the American Jews get Truman and Eisenhower to send in terms of foreign aid, and without the other kinds of aid that Israel gets around the world, and without the moral support that countries know that the most powerful nation in the world is, that maybe they can't understand why, but nevertheless is backing Israel, um, Israel would have been gone a long time ago. And so, um, uh, yes, the, the Jews lobby the American government. They don't do it on their own. Everybody lobbies the American government. You know, they write books and they say, oh, the Jewish lobby and this, that, and the other. What a bunch of liars. It's not an Arab lobby. Right? It's not a, a, a General Motors lobby. It's not a Mexico lobby. I'm, I'm serious. It's not a Korean lobby. You just don't hear about it so much. That's the anti-Semitism that comes in because you always point to one. Everybody's lobbying 24-7, and um, it is what it is. So the Jews are the uh, most powerful, and this will be true as the 50s and 60s go on even more so because the new nations, what they call the third world countries, they come into being. Um, are desperate for American help, and when they go, they, 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 they totally buy into what you call the protocols of the elders of Zion. I might say, by the way, that I was listening to the radio the other day when I was driving to uh, a black station in Baltimore, I don't know what, what the number is, on 1010, I think, and uh, the guy's reading, no, this was uh, 10, 30, 11, 30, uh, the other day in the morning, and he's giving some kind of religious speech, and then he's like this, now let me read you from the appropriate parts of the protocols of the elders of Zion. That's right, Baltimore, Maryland. So, you know, don't, don't live in a fool's paradise, I'm trying to say. And in the classic Chaim Weizmann uh, fashion, many of these third world countries say like this, uh, we gotta be good to Israel in order to win the favor of the Jewish lobby in Washington so that Washington will give us the money. So they're not establishing diplomatic relations or trying to be somebody shown with Israel because they like Israel, they're trying to do it in order to get the favor as they see it of the American Jews. So it's a, quite a phenomenon when I'm speaking about the American Jewish community. It's not just another community at all. Moreover, in the wake of the Holocaust, the, um, the United States sees, not overnight, but we definitely see the trend, especially you and I who've lived through this, of the complete delegitimation of anti-Semitism and the opening of the academy and other areas of American life, American elites, to a Jewish meritocracy. It used to be, as everybody knows, you couldn't get a job in Hopkins and such places, and that changed after the Second World War. And uh, now, you know, you've had presidents of Harvard and Yale and Princeton and, and Hopkins too, by the way, who are Jewish. And, um, you know, we take it for granted today. And the older generation knows not to take it for granted. Because once upon a time it wasn't the case. And it happened because, as a result of the experience of World War II, um, Nazism and anti-Semitism and fascism became really um, not legitimate. And anything that smacked of it had to be, uh, you know, discountenanced. And uh, the Jews totally benefited from this. So it's quite a period in American history. Uh, finally, the, uh, or not finally, but uh, the American Jews are the most fecund group of Jews in the world in the uh, 40s, and uh, 40s and 50s because they're part of what we call the baby boom. Uh, people forget this, but the Americans follow what the Goyim do. And it so happens in American history I know everybody knows this in general, but maybe some of the young people don't know this. Usually in this country, it's not a high birth rate, but for the 10, 15 years after the Second World War, from 45 to 60, when all the GIs came back, and they said, we make up for lost time, and uh, people had been overseas, and they lost a piece of their life, and they did all that, and all that's true, and now everybody wanted to come home and get the GI Bill and go to college and uh, start work and, and start a family, and uh, there was a housing boom to accommodate this. So that, it's, it's all part of that, and part of the idea is that there was a tremendous optimism. And the optimism reflected itself in that time, not like today, the optimism reflected itself at that time in middle class values, including the value of having children. Right? Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. This ties in with a theme that I'll talk about in a second, but maybe I'll address it right now. One of the very interesting responses of the American broad people for a decade or, or so, for 10, 15 years, 
very interesting, was religious. Okay? Now I'm not talking about the academic elites who are always atheists. I'm talking about the broad mass of the American people. And what happened all across the country was pe you know, people aren't stupid, and they said like this, we are blessed by God. We ducked a bullet. Look at the whole world, what they went through in World War II. And, and we didn't get it. Everywhere else around the world is death and destruction and bombing and carnage and, oh, and worse. And even the countries that didn't get directly invaded went through four years of hunger and famine and the bad rationing, all the rest of it. America, poo, 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 as they say. There was no, the rationing in this country was a joke compared to what they had over there. You know that. Right? I mean, it's true, you can get everything you wanted, but you got a lot. And, um, it, it, you know, compare, as I say before, people were wise enough to understand that this country was not invaded, there was never even a bomb over here, um, the casualties were relatively light, I think it was 350,000 dead or something like that, um, which I'm not making light of, but compared to Russia at 25 million and Germany at 6 million, you, you, you understand what I'm saying. Um, the country felt like this, we are blessed by God, literally. Uh, you know, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above was a, was a popular song, not for uh, fun, you know. And uh, the result is that there was a certain religious uh, feeling in there, which expressed itself also, as I said before, partly in the, in, in the idea of the baby boom. And uh, I'll just give you one, one uh, statistic. In the U.S., right, yeah, right, exactly, take a look at that. He says, in the U.S., more babies were born from 1948 to 55 than in the previous 30 years. Total. So what does that mean? In other words, between 1925, you know, you know what I'm saying, over the course of 30 years, there were fewer actual children born than were born from between the seven years of 1948 to 1955, which caused a tremendous national shortage in what? Babysitters. <laughs> I mean it. Now, I, I'm serious. That's when the rights for babysitters shot up through the sky, <laughs> supply and demand. So uh, it's just an interesting period. Okay, you take a look at these at these statistics that you see on on, on the screen. Um, so it's, it, it's quite an interesting uh, era, as you see over here. And here, unusually, it spread to the Jews because the Jews notoriously uh, had a very low uh, and still do a very low uh, uh, demographic rate, and they still do. Now I'm not talking a couple ultras like Jews and Bene Brock and so forth. I, I get that, but that's a that's a big minority. Right, very small minority, let's put it that way. The vast majority of Jews aren't like that at all. They're not Hasidic. And uh, it's one and it's two. That's what it is. And you can't survive even as a people without three. Do you understand? I've said that before. The, what it takes to keep even is that every couple has to get married and have three. The reason is because you say, what about two? Two replace two, but it's not always like that. One of the two will be sick or will die or will have an illness or will be infertile or things like that. So it's two point something. When in real world, that means three. So it takes three just to keep even, and uh, the Jews, uh, non from, have, have not been doing it. I know you read the Pew Report and these sorts of things, and the numbers shrink uh, all the time as a result of all this, not during the years 45 to 60. It's interesting, that because since the American uh, Gentiles did that, the American Jews did that. And uh, anyway, it, as I say before, it gives this period a very specific kind of flavor. And finally, American Jews were going through a period of what is often called sort of the, uh, the golden age of American religion, perhaps. Because as I said before, people reacted to the Second World War um, with a sense of religious gratitude. Again, not the high intellectuals and the writers and uh, all that type, but the regular mass of people over there, Truman was very religious, and Eisenhower made religion a cornerstone of his administration, which he saw as America's number one card against the Russians. They're, he always said, I guess, they're atheists, they're despots, they have no uh, respect for anything uh, sacred, therefore they lie and they don't keep their word, and uh, that's why God, communism doesn't mind killing tens of millions of people and they go to sleep at night. They, you know, they don't believe in God, you see? And we're a country that's very different. This, of course, is going to have a hashpa, uh, an influence on the American Jews. Take a look at Eisenhower's inauguration, where before he gives his speech, he said, I guess, I want to start with a little tefillah. The first person to do this, and it's absolutely characteristic of the 50s and of the Cold War. This is Eisenhower's first inauguration. And here is the familiar gesture all through the campaign. And now we will have the inaugural address of President Dwight D. Eisenhower. My friends, 
uh, before I begin the expression of those thoughts that I deem appropriate uh, to this moment, would you permit me the privilege of uttering a little private prayer of my own? And I ask that you bow your heads. Almighty God, as we stand here at this moment, my associates in the, my future associates in the executive branch of government join me in beseeching that thou wilt make full and complete our dedication to the service of the people in this throng and their fellow citizens everywhere. Give us, we pray, the power to discern clearly right from wrong and allow all our words and actions to be governed thereby and by the laws of this land. Especially we pray that our concern shall be for all the people, regardless of station, race, or calling. May cooperation be permitted and be the mutual aim of those who, under the concepts of our Constitution, hold to differing political faiths, so that all may work for the good of our beloved country and thy glory. Amen. So it's, it's part of a prayer, you know. It's not a favorite one, really. But it's, and, and that's the message of the Eisenhower years. Everybody in America should be religious. You pick your religion. Nobody's telling anybody what to do, right? But everybody should be religious. If you want to be American, so we want to see you in church on Sunday or in synagogue on Saturday, you know, or, or mosque or whatever you want to do. But you should, you, but, but, but something you should do. So that's the cultural message of the 50s, of the post-war era in general, and if you see the President of the United States do it in general, it becomes accepted as very much part and parcel of what America is. I'll show you another little piece from Frank Capra's famous business, Why We Fight, that they did during the Second World War. Um, it's about American propaganda to say, you know, who are we as a people? Just a tiny little clip. The press? Yes, it's the biggest, but most important, it's the freest on Earth. Over 12,000 newspapers of all shades of opinion, books on every conceivable subject, and more than 6,000 different magazines, not counting the comics. Churches, we have every denomination. 60 million of us regularly attend, and no one dares tell us which one to go to. So you see, there's a shoulder too. Okay, that's the point. So these are the general messages. Consequently, unlike European Jews, American Jews in the post-war period want to be perceived as religious, even if they're not interested in fundamentalism or nominism. So in Europe, especially after the Second World War, it's secular. You just don't do anything. That's what the Christians do more and more until, as you know today, religion is dead in Europe, and the Christianity I'm talking about, and the Jews do also. Uh, if somebody's not a firm believer or something like this, why waste your time with uh, meaningless uh, ceremonies? Not in America. You want, you want to get a job, you want to join a club, you want to do something with us, you want to, you know, the FBI investigates it, what's your church? What? But what, what kind of religion are you? You have no religion? Well, really? No religion? What, what is that? And so the American Jews don't want to be like that. And um, therefore, even if they're not interested, I say before, in a Torah Sinai or something like that, but you want to be uh, uh, recognized as religious. For this reason, American Jews in the post-war period flocked to reform and conservative Judaism. Indeed, the 1950s are the golden years of reform Judaism and conservative Judaism with very large attendance at services, at least on high holidays and simchas. Uh, well, we'll see about that in a minute. Traditional Judaism, associated with the Yiddish-speaking, but not particularly observant Orthodox synagogue, is in ripe decadence. It held the interest of the older generation, but does not appeal to the Americanized young, the Jews of mid-century. The old ones that came over, and maybe a little bit more, like the Hamish atmosphere of the Yiddish and all the rest of it, the young ones don't like the Yiddish. Today, you take Yiddish courses because it's dead. But at that time, you know the story, the parents spoke to the kids in Yiddish, and the kids answered back in English. You know, they don't want to talk like that. The young, this huge demographic, the American Jews of the mid-century decades, that's a large group. These are the ones born in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. It's a large group. Um, where will they go? These, this is the prize that all the denominations compete to win. Because that's the future if you're going to be successful in terms of the numbers. They come, this demographic, from traditional homes, often with a dose of Yiddish language, 
But they themselves, born in the 20s, the 30s, 40s, they have no chinuch. They're public school product, products. The Yiddishkeit they have grown with, up with does not necessarily translate into halachic punctiliousness at all. Here we have, uh, uh, this is, I'll show you, I'll, I want to talk about those in a second. This is something, I won't say who it is, a friend of mine sent me this, and uh, this from the 50s. Uh, here's a Seder, it's Orthodox. Uh, hear me out. It's, Orthodox. it's a Seder in Baltimore, Maryland, and one problem, what the heck is somebody taking a photograph in a Seder? It's the 50s. No, that's my point. You get it? It's very traditional. If you look closely, maybe don't look too closely. He says, if you look, if, if you look, now they're all staring. He says, if you, if, if you look closely, it's a grandfather with a white beard and so forth, and the family's all dressed, very religious, all the rest of it. But the cousin there says, like, this is a wonderful scene. We should, we should have a picture of it. You see, it's the 40s, it's the 50s. So as I said before, the traditionalism doesn't necessarily translate into halachic punctiliousness. And I'm sure you know Professor Chaim Salvechik has written that famous uh, essay, they're, they're publishing it now, uh, I think Rupture and Transformation, <laughs> I always think that has to do with a hernia, you know. but, but nevertheless, or Reconstruction, yeah, that's even better, you know, Rupture and Reconstruction. But uh, what he's talking about, the difference between the, the, the this, but he's, he's Chaim Salvechik is not a young person, and he's in the 70s, and um, um, he, he's from that demographic. I mean, he grew up, I don't know, in the 30s and 40s or something like that. And he writes about his father, Rabbi Yoshebert Salvechik, synagogue in Boston, which uh, was full of Yiddish-speaking people, all the rest of it. But the traditionalism does not translate into halachic punctiliousness. And he talks about, you can read it. He said, the president of Shul insists on bowing down on Yom Kippur for, you know, for the ha-kohanim, and all the money rolls out from the, from the pocket, right? <laughs> but both are significant, right? But both are significant. His whole point is like this, but the guy wants to be in Shul Yom Kippur, and moreover, of course he knows that you do korim. You know, the ha-kohanim, that's what you do. And people speak, so it's that kind of a, a, a very interesting uh, sort of era. 1952 to 56 is a golden age of conservative Judaism, I repeat, conservative Judaism, which appeals to the largest segment of the young, of this demographic, the children of the traditionalists. Those, again, as I say, born in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, conservative Jewish leaders attribute this to the power of their ideas and the force of their personalities. Here's Louis Finkelstein, the head of the the chance of the Jewish Theological Center. We got on Time Magazine. I mean, in America, that is the first, okay? That a rabbi, as a rabbi, should be on the cover over here. And what Time Magazine is saying is like this. This is, you know, the, 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 the peak of American uh, Judaism, okay? But in spite of what the leaders argue, the polls always indicate that conservative Judaism is the most popular because of what I always call the Goldilocks effect, right? You know, Goldilocks. This bed is too big. This one's too small, and this one's just right. And so the polls always tell you, the reform is too not religious. The orthodox is too religious. And conservatives, just right. Okay? So it's got nothing to do with the, they don't read Louis Ginsburg's uh, responsa, and they don't read the learned essays of Saul Lieberman, or, uh, you know, Abraham J. Heschel, or something like that. It's Goldilocks, right? And that's, you know, does as what's the public vilt, as the, as the old uh, song goes. This, this, this works great. And... Uh, it, it's it's uh, a powerful demographic, and plus, it coincides also with the huge post-war move to the suburbs. Because they say before, everybody came back, they got the GI Bill, they're going to go to school, they're going to make money, they're going to want a house, everybody's getting married. It's not this business of people living by themselves or whatever, you know, living with others. It's, it's the traditional situation. Boy wants to marry girl after boy finishes college or something like that, or at least halfway through. Remember, the GI Bill is paying for the college. Okay, and boy wants to be a dentist or something like that. Girl wants to be a housewife. How's in Harriet, right? It's not a, it's not two salaries yet. It's the good old days when Harriet can stay home. Obviously, the one I'm working. And so, uh, it's the American dream, right? You move to a nice place. You have a couple of bedrooms. Uh, you know, it's a, a, a parking lot. Consider in the city. Do you know in Baltimore, Maryland, there was a time, and in cities across the United States, you were not allowed to park on the street. That's why if you go to some of the neighborhoods downtown. You know, they, they, if they tell you long ago, uh, you couldn't have a car if you lived down there, simply because there was nowhere to put it, unless you were very wealthy and you owned something called a garage in you know, Monument Street or someplace like that, which, is, which wasn't done, and maybe uh, some of the very rich people in uh, Mount Vernon Place or something like that. Um, and now you move out to the suburbs. First of all, you can not only park on the street, you can actually stick it into the driveway. <laughs> you know, what we take for granted was, was brand new in America is, is unparalleled luxury. 
You understand? And so the result is that if you're moving out to the suburbs, you're not, where's the shul? Got to drive. You see? So it's part of the Goldilocks effect. <laughs> it's not that, the, the, you know, if you go to an Orthodox shul, they're going to still stay in the town. And, and, and otherwise, they'll tell you, you know, to live near the shul or, to, you know, don't drive or something like that. To the Orthodox, of course, who are losing right and left, I mean, they're hemorrhaging. Orthodox, if you identify the Orthodox as the traditionalists, they're, they're, they're bleeding. Uh, they say, this is not a, a worthwhile, this is, uh, um, what do you call it, the weakness of seeking a life of ease. Okay? Just looking for the easy way out. Don't want to keep kosher, pain in the neck. Don't want to have to keep Shabbos, can't turn on the lights, can't see the TV, can't do this, can't do that. Who wants to be part of this? Okay? And uh, the Orthodox say, so it's not a matter of, 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 of philosophy or something like this. He's just looking for an easy life. And oh boy, Rabbi Aaron Kotler, and, and even Rabbi Lukstein from the opposite end of the Orthodox spectrum. Uh, what is he? He's, he's saying conservative Judaism is legitimate? No, it represents weakness. Come to my shul. Everything's very modern, everything's very orthodox, and you don't have to, uh, you, you can live actually without turning on the lights. So uh, the masses, however, don't listen, they vote with their feet. They can make all the speeches they want. But if you look at the numbers in 1945, 1950, 1960, and these years, the public does what the public wants to do. They're not interested, they don't even know these guys exist. Nor did joining the conservative synagogue mean that people start attending uh, services uh, more often. Already in the 40s, conservative rabbis are complaining about that well-known phenomenon, the large synagogue with rows upon rows of empty seats on a regular Shabbos. The same phenomenon that had marked traditional orthodoxy as decadent. The whole argument that conservative Judaism had propounded ever since its origins, and particularly in the 1920s and 30s, are orthodox show is old guys, is nobody's there. On Shul and Shabbos morning, it's, it's 10 old men, 20 old men, uh, a few out the Yiddinists maybe. Uh, the regular public is elsewhere. Uh, they're at the golf course, you know, wherever they are. We're going to bring them in. If we change the order of prayers and you change the seating arrangements, you change this, that, and the other, then they'll bring them in. It wasn't really true in, in a factual basis. Uh, you bring them in for the high holidays in big numbers. You bring them in if it's a bar mitzvah or it's a simcha or some special occasion. But in ordinary time, even with the driving, the parking lot's empty too. And, and, and these were the issues that conservative Jews and movement writes about in their internal documents, which are fascinating to read um, in, this, in this era. Conservative Judaism in the USA has always been conflicted between its right and its left. That's a, a very interesting feature of the history of conservative Judaism. Now, it's also true of orthodoxy as well. But I'm, I'm, for the moment, I'm speaking about the conservative movement, which is about 100 years old. It's now the year 2014 we just entered, and Solomon Schechter showed up here around 1902. So you can, you know, figure those, it's about 100 years old. Um, from early on, they always were, as I say before, pulled to the right and to the left. It has a history of making, if, if you look at it historically, conservative Judaism, after 100 years, it has an interesting history of making a radical change to the left and then trying to hunker down and dig in without moving further to the left. For example, those who permitted mixed seating were against driving on Shabbos. Those who were permitted driving on Shabbos were against women rabbis. Those who voted for that were opposed to legalizing homosexual behavior. And those who were okay with that were opposed to gay rabbis. But it's always moved to the left more and more and more. It's kind of interesting. So the dynamic is an interesting one. Solomon Schechter and Louis Ginsburg and Alexander Marx were the three big titans of the conservative, the big scholars over there. We're, we're, we're much more on the right, shall we say. Even though if you want to get down and dirty to it, you know, you can talk about the basic hashkafa level, but people weren't, Eastern European Jews weren't built this way. Most people say like this, is a guy, uh, uh, you know, drive on Shabbos? Uh, do they keep kosher? Don't ask me what butcher they go. They keep kosher, you know, do they, the basic things, they go to shul on, 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 uh, on uh, you know, on a regular basis, certainly on yontif and all. Is it worth it? You know, that, that, that was the uh, general uh, attitude of the masses. Currently, by the way, conservative Judaism has moved beyond this to this to this. If you follow the news, and I know many do, conservative Judaism right now, their arguments are about uh, counting a uh, guy for a minion. Okay? It's moved past the uh, uh, gay rabbis or something like that. This is a new item because, as you know, the demographic situation in America is everyone's intermarried, and the intermarried spouse comes sometimes to services, and they feel very offended if they're not allowed to participate. Uh, consider, for example, I'm, I'm serious about this. I couldn't make I couldn't make it up, but I'm not. He says, uh, 
consider a, 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 a couple in which one member is, is Jewish and the other one is, let's say, just for argument's sake, let's say the father's not Jewish and the mother's Jewish, just for argument's sake, and they're having a bar mitzvah in a considered synagogue. And, um, and here's the father sitting like a stone. Uh, the mother is called up to have an aliyah. The son is called up to have an aliyah. The brother is called up for this. And, and, and who's this guy? Nothing. This is, this is the attitude now. Okay? And what the conservative rabbis are saying, they're, as you see in the headlines, they're dealing with this now all across the United States. Is we have to find a way to give him something also because otherwise the family might move away and all you do is lose another family in Judaism. So where his heading is, he counts for a million too. And next thing he'll be the shliach zibur and so forth. And I know people think I'm exaggerating all the rest of it, and I think I, I wish I were, but th that, that's the uh, direction it's heading. Now I'm taking you back 60 years in the 50s, where it, hasn't, uh, it, it wasn't there at that time. It was elsewhere. On each occasion, I mean, in the past, a group rose within the conservative movement who wanted to push further to the left. Otherwise, they would have stopped, for example, at mixed pews. And this led to the many interesting tensions that characterized the conservative movement in the early and middle years of the 20th century. I think most Orthodox Jews aren't familiar with this because they don't pay attention to this sort of uh, kind of business. But we're not the only group in the world. That's ridiculous. Actually, Orthodox is the smallest. There are large movements of other denominations in the United States, as everyone knows, and they have their internal dynamics back and forth. And in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s, and, and even afterwards, there are constant battles within that movement, you know, move to the right, move to the left, all the rest of it. and. Um, the conservative movement, for example, uh, in the early years under Cyrus Adler, uh, yeah, oops, he said under Cyrus Adler, um, what he called was uh, uh, the right held off the left. Let's put it that way. We don't have a, yeah, there he is. Yeah, Cyrus was a was a, uh, a layman actually. He was a head of the Jewish Theological Seminary from 1950 to 1940. It's 25. It's a long time, quarter century, and he was a right winger. Uh, he actually was president of Mikveh Israel, some know in, in, in Philadelphia. And what is that? It was one of those shuls like Chizik used to be once upon a time. It's conservative, but it has separate seating. Meaning it's actually quite traditional. It's, it straddles the fence between Orthodox and conservative, and that's how he liked it. And so his whole point was the conservative is a kind of modern Orthodox. So you see how the titles look? I'm throwing the titles back and forth and banding them around on purpose. Um, on each occasion, a group wrote within the movement who wanted to push further to the left, and this was the, was the tensions. Um, in the, well, no, let's go back one. He says, um, in the years of the 20s and the 30s, up to his death in 1940, um, Mordecai Kaplan was the uh, enfant terrible, you know, the, the, the leader of the left. And he said, let's change the, the davening, and let's change the kol nidre, and let's reorganize this, and let's redefine the term God, and all the rest of it. And he's always saying, oh, keep it out of this. And uh, on the other hand, he wouldn't fire him from being the professor at the uh, homiletics at the Jewish Theological Seminary, and he was the most dynamic of all the teachers there. You can see from all the memoirs. And so the bottom line is, the right is in control of the movement, but all the new graduating rabbis are, are, are for the most part, under the influence of Mordecai Kaplan. They spread his ideas in there. And so the movement, whatever the leaders want to say, is moving to the left in very interesting ways in the years that I'm talking about. Um, as we'll see in a second, the, um, yeah, you know, th this will be, these are, let's put it this way, he lives to be 100 years old until the 1980s, so he's still pushing to the left over here, and Rabbi Agus from Baltimore will be, again, one of the big, and we'll talk about him in a second, will be one of the big people who pushes even further to the left, you see? And so uh, that's the trend. I'm trying to point out that the conservative move was not moving to the right in the post-war period, to put it in simple English. The, um, after Adler's death in 1940, so we're talking about the 40s and the 50s. Uh, Louis Finkelstein, who Adler had appointed as his uh, successor and was his right-hand man, and was a right-winger, shall we say, tried to hold off the left wing. But in the post-war years, the left gets stronger and more assertive. Uh, Rabbi Salman Goldman, that's when he was real young. Rabbi Salman Goldman from uh, Cleveland, Chicago, was uh, the leading synagogue in the United States in many ways, and the most dynamic and, and powerful force in the conservative movement. And uh, oh, he wants to, you know, he's, the, the letters have been published. He's, him and Finkelstein went to uh, Yeshiva at the same time, and they came to their classmates, and he's saying, why don't you recognize the trends of modernity and, uh, you know, get with the program and so forth. And, uh, and he's winning, okay? And he's winning. And so, as this was happening, Remember, the conservative movement is exploding with hundreds of new congregations all the time. I mean, they figure they're, they're doing something right. From coast to coast, A, new congregations are being formed in the suburbs, 
B, the Orthodox shows is switching to conservative. I'll give you just one example. Chizik Amun in Baltimore. But it's true across the country. In the years 1945 to 1960, dozens at least, and maybe, maybe more than dozens, from coast to coast, a, a, a switch, both membership uh, meetings, from Orthodox to conservative. It's just the way it is. The left comes to be dominant. As a result, the notion, dear to the hearts of the right, that conservative Judaism is just a modern orthodoxy, a very modern orthodoxy, gets shredded in these periods. So here we go back to issues of the 1800s. Zachariah Frankel started the conservative movement in Germany in the middle of the 1800s. Already from day one, Samson Rafael Hirsch said, I'm not interested in the fact that these people keep Shabbos, which they did, or they keep the same city, which they did. Do you believe in Torah Messina? Are you a fundamentalist? Okay? Are you committed to, you know, do you understand the Torah Shabbat to be God's word, all the rest of it? And if not, then this is a Reform Judaism. And when Hirsch said this, People say, so you're a right-wing fanatic, you're nuts, and you're off the wall, and so forth. Oh, he, he caught a lot of hell, and so forth. But it kind of unfolded that way, <laughs> you see? And for 100 years after that, from 1850 to 1950, uh, he was, his view was considered by many Orthodox Jews to be too extreme. But as reality marched on in the post-war years, people came to say, oh, yes, oh, he's right. Because they're getting rid of this, they're changing that, they're moving to another thing. And, the, and we are really seeing the emergence of what you and I are familiar with today, which is a world in which the notion that conservative Orthodox have anything to do in common is, 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 is not counted. People would look like weird. It's two different denominations completely. But in the years I'm talking about, and until then, there was a lot of this blurred area in which people say, it's conservative reform, what's the, Orthodox, what's the difference? If you want a perfect example of what I'm talking about, maybe I'll show it later. Uh, Rabbi Rosenblatt from uh, Beth Tefillah. Everybody here, many people are old enough to know what I'm talking about with Sammy Rosenblatt. He's graduated at the Jewish Theological Seminary, also at Smicha of Rav Cook. What do you call Beth Tefillah? Now, now it's moved into Orthodox pretty uh, definitely, even on the extreme left. In the middle years of the 1950s, it, was, it, it, it liked the fact that it's conservative and it's also Orthodox. People like that kind of um, position. The Kodak moment. Of this trend, in 1950, it's the tshuva, the responsum, from any driving on Shabbos, which of course was published by Rabbi Agus, who says if you hear, you know, you can just read what he says. We'll never get anywhere by looking at Jewish law for answers, <laughs> right? Past offers no parallel. To continue and modify the traditional interdiction of writing the Sabbath will lead to a Sabbathless Judaism. So we have to figure out how to uh, save Shabbos by uh, allowing driving. Um, this was the argument. Now, uh, by the way, Professor Rosalit, uh, Jenna Rosenblatt in New York, has written very interesting articles where she did all the research. All you have to do is go back to the um, Rabbinical Assembly and the other conservative annual conventions in which they debate and discuss this back and forth and papers are going up and down. And there was a lot of fights over this sort of thing. As you can see, uh, from the opposite point of view, Rabbi Gordas, Robert Gordas, right? No, no, oops, guys, this is his father I'm talking about. Oh, that's him, yeah, that's him. To modify Jewish law in order to bring in the conformity with the modern way of life is tantamount to amending the U.S. Constitution to harmonize it with the viewpoint of an anarchist, okay? Which is another point of view. And they, you know, they battled it uh, back and forth. Um, by 1961, incidentally, this is interesting, a decade later, the hoped-for benefits of the heter have not materialized. They said that if you allow everybody to drive to synagogue, and only to synagogue and nowhere else, because that's what it said, you can only drive to Shul. Um, this will bring the, fa the Jewish families and their masses to the synagogues on Saturday. But it didn't. So the United Synagogue, which is the umbrella branch of the conservative movement, sends out a questionnaire to 300 rabbis in 1961. Did we do the right thing, they ask. And I might say, populistically, they write the question, what is your opinion? Is it okay to drive to someone else's Shul for a bar mitzvah? <laughs> right? Because you only said you could drive to show, okay? But on the other hand, it is going to show, okay? So in other words, let's put it this way. Most of the people, by the way, respond, most of the 300 rabbis respond to the questionnaire by saying, um, what we say is not relevant to the lady anywhere. Anyway, whether or not they drive is not a function of our ruling. It's, you know, in other words, why, why, why do we even have to go into this? And it goes to show you the kind of funny tensions that are characterizing the left wing, which is, let's be clear and articulate and honest and, and above board about it, and we will save Judaism. And the others just say, no, you won't. It's just, you're just trying to you know, re 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 
orient Judaism to make it more like, and this is what really was going on, to make it more like a Protestant type of American religion to comport it with Eisenhower's America. You see? And uh, there you have it. The conservative movement's success, and they did have a big following, will have more to do with sermons, well delivered, Israel activities, and the Goldilocks effect than they will with conservative halakha. Uh, even today, very few people in conservative act can read the response, even though they're online, you know, the movement. They just do what you do. And so that's the result is, the result, which is that America's most growing denomination, because that's what they are, will unfortunately do nothing to remedy the ignorance or vapidity of the American Jewish masses. Because everything we're talking about, all the activities, don't result in any kind of intensive Jewish education, any kind of um, uh, increased Jewish serious literacy, um, profound awareness of you know, Jewish culture, which was all part of what was hoped for. Maybe it will drive, and maybe they won't keep arms and kosher, but they'll know all about it. It didn't develop that way. And uh, as said, in, in, in that regard, but perhaps, you know, from an Orthodox point of view, it was inevitable. The explosion of, uh, excuse me, the explosion of conservative Judaism is a big threat, obviously, to the Orthodox in the 1940s and 50s. One shul after another, as I said before, switches from Orthodox to conservative. The Mechitza, in particular, is under siege. And uh, this was the era in which uh, these three always showed up in courts all across the United States. Because the situation is always the follows. I don't even have to go through this. It's Cincinnati, it's New Orleans, it's Mount Clement, it's, it's all across it from east coast to west. It's a shoal. It's an orthodox shoal. At least that's how they always define themselves. Now it's in 1950 or so, or thereabouts. And uh, there's the move. And uh, they want to make a conservative. And they'll have mixed seating, get rid of the mechisa. Uh, that's usually the biggie. And uh, things of this nature. And it's always usually something like two thirds versus one third or three quarters versus a quarter. But the quarter, the 20%, 25%, 30%, whatever it is, who are still Orthodox, they take it to court. And they say you're violating the Schultz Charter and Constitution. Because the Schultz Charter and Constitution inevitably was written 30, 40 years ago when they came over from the old country and said it should be run according to Orthodox Judaism. And that's what the Charter says. And people have given money to the Schultz on that basis and things of this nature. And what you're doing is illegal, okay? And what does a judge do in America? How does he know? And so what happens is you get two sets of lawyers, obviously, and then each lawyer brings an expert testimony. And when they bring the expert testimony, it's always the same characters. Rabbi Salvation from YU, Rabbi Lester Silver sometimes from the Gurus Rabbanim, on the side that says, oh no, a mechitza is absolutely uh, part of uh, Orthodox Judaism, and any shul that gets rid of it is violating the charter. The conservative always bring in Rabbi Agus, who, Jacob Agus, born in Lithuania, uh, he went to school in Europe, he was, uh, went to YU, he never went to conservative, he went to YU, and had Yuri Yuri Yon Yon from Moshe Salvechik, with Big Talmud Chacham, and uh, Rabbi Revel, when he graduated, I'll tell you right now, when he graduated YU, which was like 1935 or something like that, Rabbi Revel wanted him to be successor as the head of YU, because he was very brilliant. And, and his first, uh, and his first um, what should I say, position was in Norfolk, Virginia, when she came with ladies in the 30s. And then he changed. <laughs> then he went to Harvard to get a, a PhD in philosophy, and th things changed. And he changed. And uh, between 1936 and 1946, he really changed. Okay? Uh, so the point is like this. This is a dangerous guy. Because they're coming in and they're telling the judge, the Talmud says this, and the Shulchan Aruch said this, here come Vegas, so, but it also says that, and it says this and that and the other. A judge, typically, if he's hearing on both sides, he said, this is not something the court can interfere in. It's a, it's a separation of church and state, which therefore means that the majority wins. Because it's always the case where the minority is suing to stop what the majority is doing. In order for that to happen, the court has to issue an order. And the court usually, most of the time, is reluctant to issue the order because this one says, this is orthodox, this one's not orthodox. I ask you, if I would add, you know, bring you in as a judge to your two sides on the Hindu thing, you would know. It's not your religion. So, imagine being a judge. You know, the Talmud says... In the temple, in the time of Simchas Beis Shueva, they had a balcony for the women. The judges are like, you're crazy. You understand? <laughs> and that's how Rabbi Lezer Silver used to, used, used to do it. Rabbi Salvechik already is an educated person. He would give it in a philosophical manner. Um, so they won 9 out of 10, one, uh, the conservative. Uh, the, there was one case in Mount Clemens' case with this guy Litvin. It's famous that, uh, that he won. But that's unusual. And when he won, by the way, he lost because, you know, the whole Schultz, the, the, the overall majority seceded. They just made another conservative show anyway. 
You see? So this is the trends, as they say, before the time. What we see is the, 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 the glacier is breaking. The, the old kind of united Jewish community in which you have a single community, some people on the right, some people on the left, some people in the middle, is breaking into distinct parts, which would be totally divorced one from the other. And the rigid, rigid uh, definitions and separations are kicking in, which characterize the Jewish life in America, sadly, that we're all familiar with today, which is just different groups and they have nothing to do one with the other. Um, I, I cannot forbear to share this story with you. I just heard it the other day. Uh, I mentioned in my show today at uh, Shal Shudas, uh, sometimes the shoe's on the other foot. The, I think today's the art set of the free ticket of Lubavitch Rebbe, if I'm not mistaken, today or tomorrow. And uh, so he came to America, which is 1940, I think. Um, so where are you going to live? 770. Where do you get 770 from? He said, what's the, what's the hottest, no, uh, most expensive Jewish neighborhood? Uh, where the Brooklyn Jewish Center is. In Brooklyn, right? He, that was the best neighbor, Crown Heights, at that time, of course. And uh, so he said, that's where he put the headquarters. So the Lubavitch takes up headquarters over there, and because uh, it wouldn't be a fancy neighborhood. And then the 20th century proceeds, as we know, and the neighborhood changes, and the Lubavitch don't move, but the, most of the people in Brooklyn Jewish Center move, and by the time the process is over, by the time we get to the 1990s, uh, is nobody left in the center and the Chabad buys it or takes it over one way or the other as these things happen. At that point, a couple who are snowbirds, they, 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 they grew up in the Brooklyn Jewish Center under Rabbi Leventhal, which is a conservative, which they had his, hers, and ours. Right? There, was, there was a men's section, it was a ladies' section, and the middle was mixed. That goes back to the 1920s. And it was once upon a time, it's a huge place with a pool and everything. One time it was, it was the number one synagogue perhaps in America, or one of the leading synagogues in America, uh, when a very eloquent uh, Rabbi Leventhal was uh, famous for his sermons. And uh, anyway, the point is that this lady is now suing the Lubavitch. They can't take it with a shul and change, put a mechitz in. Why? Because it says in the charter it's conservative. And mechitz is, is against the law of conservative. And so you end up with the reverse of this. <laughs> okay? <laughs> you end up with the reverse of this, where they come again they say, conservative means can't have mechitza. And the lawyer for the Lubavitch says, conservative could have a mechitza, right? And the argument, of course, goes like this. The Jewish Theological Seminary has for many years, maybe not currently, but for 100 years or a long, long time, many decades, they had a, 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 an orthodox uh, synagogue, you might say, in their, in their uh, premises, uh, you know, with the mechitza, all the rest of it. Louis Ginsburg davin there, Saul Lieberman davin there, all the other big machers davin there for decades after decades. So it's... So, so it's this in reverse, you understand? So, uh, so she lost, so I'm sure Rabbi Agus is turning over in the grave. The, um, so demographics does funny things, that's all I'm saying. Now, um, Baltimore is, is a little bit, as, as, as is often the case, I don't have time to go into this in great detail, because we have so much to do tonight, but Baltimore is always exceptional. If you know the history of Baltimore Jewish community, it's always never exactly like the rest of the country. And uh, in Baltimore, you have, in the years I'm talking about, the saga of Betafil and Abchizagamuno. Two of the largest congregations uh, are, are, are members are conservative, but orthodox. In other words, in 1940, both the Betafil and the Abchizagamuno um, were officially, that's how they describe it, so the fishing members of the conservative movement. Uh, the rabbis went to Jewish Theological Seminary, that's where they send their money and uh, they identify with the uh, culture, but they're the old conservative movement, which is uh, separate seating, the regular sitter, the hurt sitter, and uh, basically, it's, it's totally orthodox in practice. What people do on their own is a separate story, but as far as the shul is concerned, it's orthodox in practice. Um, but then, when the Second World War is over, comes the big push in both shuls, uh, as is true across America. And in the conservative shul, it's an overwhelming push, and the Chizagamuna, even though the rabbis uh, all fights about it, but it happens. And they switch totally into conservative, they get rid of the chitza and the whole nine yards. In the case of Betafila, uh, Rabbi Rosenblatt, as I said before, was conservative, but he was also orthodox. And he was more orthodox than conservative. And so he fought this tooth and nail, and he won by one vote. Okay? There was a whole group. You, by the way, if you think I'm saying this, go to the Bethel website, they'll tell you the whole thing, uh, Befeirish. He says, uh, one group, these guys were rich and they were angry. The rabbis, you know, get them. And by the way, he was a man in principle. He had already taken it. He thought he was going to lose. And he already took a stellar in Toronto. You understand? Rabbi Rosenbach, there was a, a shul, I forget which one it was, in Toronto, which was still conservative but much more traditional. And he was going to go there. So he was really prepared to go down on this issue. And the shul didn't want to lose him. And so he won by one vote. As a result, the, the losers said, okay, if that's the way it is, that's the way it is. Um, and they went and started Bethel. Okay? And they brought Agus. 
And that's how the whole thing started. So um, Beth Tefillah, even to this day, has a kind of funny profile in, with these associations. But the key years were what I told you before. It was 1947, 48, all the rest of it. When the die was cast, they went with the Orthodox. You, you know, that, that's just a very interesting fact. Due to the intense traditionalism that characterizes Baltimore, Maryland, which is not the same as, as is the case across the country. Um, I have to tell you another story now that I'm thinking about it. Charleston. This is a good one. Also, 1948, I forget the shul over there, but uh, the, the British Shalom, something or other. And uh, it's the big, it's the big uh, uh, vote. And uh, they had the big, the big meeting. And it's, uh, I think, five speakers on this side and five speakers on this side. And the guys in favor of the conservative, they have the speeches. And then they have the five on this side. And uh, uh, the first guy says like this. He says, how can you change the shul? This was founded. It's a from shul. You know, they found all the rest of it, voted down. The next guy said like this, our fathers and mothers started this show with a certain idea and they poured sweat and blood into it, it's voted down. The third speaker, it says with a little guy, a pants presser. <laughs> and he said like this, I'm warning you, you have conservative show, you're gonna have a lady president. They voted it down. <laughs> so America is a funny place when it comes to these sorts of things. Now, the Orthodox in general have the great task or challenge how to win the hearts and minds of the mid-century generation of American Jews. How do you win over the guys that were born in the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s? To put in simple words. You know, who are not going to refrain from driving, and they're not going to stop turning on the lights on Saturday. That's who they are. So how do you keep them in the Orthodox? Um, two schools of thought emerge. One is modern Orthodox, as the term was defined at that time. It's not the same way the term is defined today. The least you can do those are theories copy the competition. Anybody in business will tell you that, right? If you've got a restaurant, the other one's doing this, at least do what the other one's doing. And so, if the conservative have a number of features that are drawing people, do the same thing. Have uh, English services, um, have responsive readings, have uh, Friday activities, have clubs, you know, all th anything you could do within the Shulchan Ark, you know, right? Do it, because why not? If they got a bowling league, why shouldn't you have a bowling league? Don't make any sense not to. You see? And so whatever you possibly can't get rid of Mechitz. Oh, we're stuck with that. But everything else you can do. That's, that was the uh, theory behind it those days. Now, um, this strategy has a certain success, but for a generation or so. It's very interesting. Looking back as a historian now with, with, with hindsight, we can see this worked for that generation, what I just described to you. It worked for the Jews born in the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s, so to speak. And it was attractive to them, and that's why you had tons of synagogues here and across the country in which the Jews, they drive, they do this, that, and the other, but they all go to uh, Orthodox, modern Orthodox synagogues, um, which you know, don't bother them too much, and offer many, many activities. And it, it, it did honestly capture their interest and imagination, but not their kids. That's the interesting part, right? Not their kids. And so the result is you have in Baltimore, of course, but all across North America, a situation in which this particular demographic uh, takes over or becomes a shoal, let's say for example in the 50s, and, the, and let's say they're young, and they're still there in the 60s and 70s, they're a little bit older, and they're still there in the 80s and 90s, then now they're older, and now that's uh, the, the end of the 90s, beginning of the 21st century, they're dying out. And, and what's the point? They're the only ones, the kids aren't coming. The kids went to public school, the kids grow up, one thing, they, one thing, sure, they don't want to do. They don't want to go back to that show. These groups are, the, the people I'm talking about are very comfortable in the show. This one's the Gabai, and this one's the, the chairman of the breakfast committee, and this one runs the Sunday programs, and the other one's in charge, as I say, of the bowling league, and this one's in charge of the Israel bonds, and the other one's in charge of the trips, and, and all which is good. Can't get the kids to be interested in it. So it was a strategy that did work for a certain demographic. And the modern Orthodox, patted themselves in the back and said, look how many people are keeping from going conservative. If you want to put it in halachic terms, all these people, is, the, the, the marriages and the divorces and all that sort of thing will be kedas or kedin as much as is possible. We're doing a, miss, a big miss. We have to stretch here and pull here and cut corners here, all the rest of it, but there's a reason for it. You see? And it was, as I say before, a temporarily successful. If you went back to Baltimore, Maryland, for example, uh, 60 years ago, I could probably name, and Jake certainly could name, and you know, two dozen shoals or more that no longer exist. 
but were flourishing once upon a time in Lower Park Heights and Forest Park and places like that, all over the place, F thriving synagogues once upon a time, um, with, with active members and all the rest of it, and uh, they're not here anymore. Why aren't they here anymore? They died out. Right? There was no fights. Their kids weren't interested in coming. And so the same people you saw in the 1950s is the same people you saw in the 1990s. It's just a little bit older. The same guy that Davin Shachrath you know, for the Ahmed in 1955 is the same guy Davin Shachrath for the Ahmed in 1995. The same one who's laning in this and this year is the one who's laning in that and that year. The only problem is, you know, they're, 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 it's not what their kids were interested in. Because, as is always the case, the parents, the, the demographic I'm talking about, grew up in the old neighborhood. And therefore, the sounds of Yiddish and a certain amount of Yiddish guys were native to them and felt, come from Munkozi. Their kids, on the other hand, grew up with zero Yiddish and totally public school and went to college. And why would anybody want to go on a Saturday morning and waste their time? <laughs> but that sort of thing. That's the end. It just wasn't relevant to them. You see? So it's, the 50s is a snapshot moment of a certain demographic and a certain type of shul which really did flourish in the 50s. I'm defining flourishing in the sense of having large membership. I'm defining flourishing in the sense, if some of you will remember this, uh, the shows I'm talking about had weddings all, every week and during the week and bar mitzvahs galore. I mean, uh, the caterers, it was a golden age. You understand? Uh, Bluefell, Slider, it was a golden age because all the shows, I mean, you know, one after another after another, they, there was a lot of stuff going on because of baby boom. Right? And life cycle events, and people still, if the parents that I'm talking about want their kids to get married in the synagogue or something along those lines. But the next generation didn't. That's what I'm talking about, okay? And so um, the origins of modern orthodoxy that I'm talking about actually start in New York City with Rabbi Leo Young and Rabbi Luxstein and Rabbi Her Herbert Goldstein, the three big synagogues in Manhattan, which uh, already in the 1910s and 20s, uh, to their credit, were attracting people who weren't Shomer Shabbos. And that's the point. They're attracting people who want to come and attend the Orthodox service because all three of them were great pulpiteers. They were very eloquent in sermons. The shuls offered a shul with a pool, as the expression goes. It really did. In other words, this was a movement where the shul replaced the JCCs. It was a, a movement at, at a time. It didn't go anywhere in a broad sp spectrum. But the shul offered everything. Um, there's no need to go conservative, so to speak. You know? uh, they're well-to-do, the kind of people we're talking about. So there's no such thing as de classe. I don't want to go to Orthodox synagogue because that's a bunch of poor schleppers and the conservative place across the street. In, in Leo Young synagogue, in, in Kailas Yeshurun, in, in Herbert Goldstein, it's millionaires. You know, the guys who made their money in the textiles. And they want to go to Orthodox, they want to go to Orthodox. You, you see? And so people thought and dreamed all across the United States they'll create this phenomenon. Um, by the middle of the 20th century, by the 1950s, it's in full bloom. Uh, let's see, does anybody know? What, okay, okay, I'll ask the people in this audience. Anybody know who these faces are? <laughs> Rabbi from yesteryear? Okay, Jake, who's this? It's from this synagogue. <laughs> okay, and who's this? Rabbi Drazen. Yuri Miller, that's Beth Jacob. Of course, Rabbi Bach. Rabbi Max. Yeah. What, what do they all have in common? Even though they're different people, of course. And they do, what? No beard. First of all, besides the, yes, that's true, it's no beard. No, 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 she's right. No, 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 100%. You know, 100%, it's no beard. It's over, they all successfully in the 1950s ministered to large and flourishing modern Orthodox congregations. It, what became their Talmud, a Liberty Jewish Center, uh, Maya Shul, the Hard Science Fair Israel, Beth Jacob, the Shul in the Park. Right? Once about, you've, heard, you've heard stories when, on high holidays, they needed the cops. You've, you've heard of that, right? You know, because it was such a big uh, 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 overflow crowd to handle the... They were, they were, they were doing very well. Ain't there today. Right? Beth Jacob is gone. The Jewish Center is not in great shape. This show has reorganized itself. That's why we're here tonight. Right? Rabbi Drazen's show is basically, you know, not there anymore. This show is completely... It's, it, it's, it's interesting. So... Um, this is characteristic, and as I said before, at least we're keeping away from the conservatives. Obviously, the Achilles heel in the whole thing is no chinuch. Okay? The Achilles heel is that they, they, they think Achilles heel they hit the conservative, which was no real education. Yeah, they had afternoon schools and Talmud Torahs and synagogue, all that, but we all know that that's a waste of time, unfortunately. Uh, most, u usually. Not always, but usually. And uh, the result is, as I said before, the children aren't attracted to modern Orthodox. When they grow up, they'll go conservative or they'll go nothing. These are the so-called nuns that you read about, N-O-N-S-E, N-O-N-E-S. 
they read about that. What, what, are you Jewish? Yes. What's your denomination? Uh, none. Right? Are you religious? I don't know. You know that, that, that's the uh, hottest item in the press these days. So it's a mid-century thing. The same demographic, as I said before, will, will go on for years and years, but then it'll, 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 it'll die out. On the other hand, on the other hand, that's not the entire story, there will be significant groups of modern Orthodox who are not going in that direction, who will create a YU culture, which is both modern and Orthodox. These will be a different demographic. Let's go to the next one, right? These will be mostly the graduates of Yeshiva University and that sort of thing, who are modern, but on the other hand, they have an education, and they are committed to make sure that their children have an education and be modern. So therefore, you're not going to have the phenomenon that I just described, which is that the parents are the only ones interested and the children aren't. The people that we're talking about over here will send their kids to the TA or wherever the equivalent is across the United States, MTA, however you want to, uh, you know, whatever the uh, um, education possible, the Jewish education day school possibilities are there. And that kind of modern orthodox is still with us today. One thinks right off the top of the head, TNAC, you know, I mean, as, as a sort of iconic representation of what, of what I'm talking about. So it's kind of interesting that we see these trends actually begin, what shall I say, you know, um, in the um, 50s, in the years I'm talking about. Indeed, the years 1952 to 56, the Belkin era, this is when uh, Rabbi Rebel had died in 1940. YU took a couple years to figure out which, what, what's going to happen. By 1945 or so, 44, uh, Rabbi Samuel Belkin, Rabbi Dr. Samuel Belkin, had taken over as the, the next president of YU. He was there for 20, 30 years. And uh, under him, especially in the 50s, YU explodes organizationally, um, and, they, and they really move to a national prominence. Look, there's Albert Einstein in Medical School. There's Einstein uh, holding the thing. There's Belkin, right? I mean. It doesn't get better than that if you're looking for American uh, valorization. Albert Einstein? Look what a chesed he did to them uh, by allowing them to use his name, which, which, which he did do. And it shows you that Einstein feels that he wants to associate his name not with the Jewish Theological Seminary, and not with the Hebrew Union College, isn't that interesting? And not with Hadassah, but with Yeshiva University. And that tells you interesting things about Albert Einstein. He didn't get any money out of this. Okay? Uh, moreover, it will pioneer in women's education. This is the first graduate class of Stern. Okay? Yeah. Who is this? All right. This person is in this audience, but I won't say who it is. You'll have to figure out on your own. Okay? First graduate class in, in, in Stern is 58. So it means they start in 54. Okay? Um, you know the, the idea of a Stern college and higher women's Jewish from education Revolutionary, correct? It means the United States in the 1950s is moving into the phenomenon that we're all familiar with now, which is the American Jewish Orthodox woman who is not ignorant at all. This is a revolution. And the years are the 50s. In fact, it starts in 50 to 56. It's, it's no Kleinikite. If you want to, um, uh, let's put it this way, if you want to talk about, um, what shall I say, Beis Yaakov, it also starts in, in, in these years. Uh, Yeshiva University, by the way, will have renowned uh, Rosh Yeshivas in there. Does anybody know who that is? Very good. David Lifshitz, yeah, who was number two to the Rosh Yeshiva Bear. Everybody was young once upon a time. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what the historians tell us. Uh, but on the other hand, it will not be what it aspired to be. Why you will not, Yeshiva University will not gain what, what it aspired to be, which would be the defining institution of American Orthodoxy. It will not even be the dominant one. But it will be one of them. No one institution or trend will comprehend, in mid-20th century, the totality of orthodoxy in America. Now, why do I put Louis Brandeis up there? For economics reasons. He's famous, for, I'm not talking from the Yiddish guy point of view. Brandeis is famous for small is better. He saw this 100 years before the rest of us. The, in the economic world, they'll tell you what's good, the big companies or the small hungry ones, right? Um, the, the beauty of the states, the Constitution of the United States, Brandeis saw, argued 100 years ago, was each state can experiment on its own. And then the others will see if it works. You want to say marijuana is legal? Let's see what happens. You want to say that gay marriage is legal? Let's see what happens. He was against federal uh, solutions to this. And my point is that the reform Judaism and conservative Judaism and even reconstruction and so forth, very centralized, top down. It's a national organization, which sounds great, right? It sounds like they have their, every conservative shawl is the same center. Every reform show is the same center. They have the same uh, order of, uh, of a protocol. They, you know, they all get together once a year, twice a year, or once every two years for national conferences and so forth. 
the rigidity and the homo homogeneity which is imposed by that stifles individual creativity. It stifles initiative. And in the long run, it's, it's not good for the enterprise. Orthodoxy, the idea that all the Orthodox ever get in a room all together is a joke, right? Nobody fights in as disorganized as, as they are. As, as orthodoxy identical with chaos. That could be a plus. Why is it a plus? A thousand flowers bloom, and everybody tries their own thing. Shlomo Karlbach, eh, Lubavitch, eh, why you? Eh, near Israel, uh, minor Orthodox, now they have open Orthodox, they have this. It's a, and you see, the market tells you what works and what doesn't work. Ah, you'll have competing overlapping sorts of, so what? As Brandeis would argue, it's better to have a certain amount of competing overlap. In the larger picture, the more, most creative solutions will emerge as the dominant ones and will more than make up for whatever little, um, you know, what's, what's the right word, overlapping and redundancy that's out there. You know, to a certain CPA type mind, the slightest redundancy is a waste of time and money and all the rest of it. But in the larger picture, if you're running a dynamic corporation, you say let the different you know, branches uh, battle it out with each other for the toelis, for the benefit of the whole enterprise. And so nobody got together, you know, five people didn't together in a room in 1950, Rebaron Cutler, Rabbi Salvation, go, let's all fight each other. Yeah? But that's the effect of what happened. It's kind of interesting in this regard. Um, and so the post-war years sees the emergence for the first time in America, for the first time ever, of a Haredi trend, as they call it today, which is a trend that gets traction for the first time from native-born American Jews. If that didn't happen, then this would not be interesting. You understand? If this was something involved some old timers or whatever, it'd just be a, a you know a, a, a piquant little uh, footnote somewhere. The point is that these people come over to the country, and they get interest and traction from boys and girls born over here, speaking English. That's the freaky part. That's something that the sociologists never figured out. Um, the trend is twofold. First, of course, the easiest one, the Hasidic. Who would ever imagine? that people like this, and who look like this, the Samar Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, the Lubavitch Rebbe, would get interest from, uh, let's say, college graduates, from native-born Americans, from people, from, from doctors and lawyers and so forth. They look so foreign, so, and they don't talk English. They're against talking English. Right? They're against college. The Lubavitch Rebbe was interviewed. They said, you for I'm against college. You went to college. He said, just because I jumped off the third story and didn't break my leg, I'm not telling someone else to do it. You see? And in spite of that, you know what I know. The Chabad, the physicists, and the big people, right? Let alone the... Tra so the fact that native-born Americans, as late as today, 60 years later, want to be Satmar Hasidim. I want to dress like that. And want to be, uh, you know, this other type of, whatever particular type of Hasid you're talking about, is, is quite un unexpected. Okay, it's a trend that develops in the 1950s, because guess what? These people weren't here before that. They physically weren't here. Um, Hasidism as an American phenomenon, as the choice of tens of thousands of American born here, starts to come together only in the early 50s. I'll tell you again, we're so used to it, we don't see the forest around us. Right? We've all grown up with this. But it's a remarkable phenomenon that has no parallel in Western history. The Jews should on purpose, having grown up in America and having all the possibilities, go into a ghetto, if you want to call it that, and like it. It's what they prefer to do was completely, you know, would have been completely rejected by any prognosticator back in the 1950s. Today there are 200,000 Hasidim in America, maybe a little more. This is a shock to the federations, obviously. This is not what their planning had in mind <laughs> when they have the endless conference after conference to figure out the future of the, of the belly button. But it's what happens. If we talk about countercultural, I mean, you don't get more counter. They say, oh, I'm in favor of counterculture. Of course, they want a left wing counter. They want Woodstock, that's countercultural. This is a shock, as you see over here. And so I couldn't find the picture, but the two famous sociologists, Marshall Sclair and later Charles Liebman, are the two number one names in mid 20th century Jewish sociology. Marshall Sclair was a big deal, and he was the expert. He wrote the book, uh, what's it called? Uh, the no, no, but it's, it, it was a certain um, um, fictional town. I forget the name of it. But the point is, where is it going in American Jewry? And the answer is it's going con to conservative Judaism. Because that's the way it looked. You understand? And the Orthodox, there'll be a few Orthodox left, maybe some autocockers in some ghetto somewhere in, in, in East Baltimore. This is how they put it. Then th th This is more or less what he writes over there, and so on and so forth. Uh, his grandson, I think, is in, in near Israel, right? <laughs> in the Kolel, right? 
Meaning that, you know, according to the normal tools of social science, he was correct. But he, as is often the case, these sociologists and other social scientists, they, they don't understand the deep trend. See, I'm a historian dumping on sociology. That's what we do, you know? So, they say, you guys look at the surface ephemeral kinds of phenomena. You count heads and how many people are in the synagogue. And guys, we say, look at the roots underneath, and then you'll see which way it's heading in the future. But nobody did that. And it wasn't until uh, the 1960s, 1965, Charles Liebman, who was a very famous uh, sociologist also, um, he writes a book called Orthodox Judaism in America in which he informs the non from as it were. Uh, guess what? There's a whole flourishing subculture going on over here. Have you ever heard of a place called Lakewood? Have you ever heard of a thing called Lubavitch? There's even something called Sotmer and it's in Williamsburg and this and that and the other and they branched across the country. And this was, you know, he was invited to speak at federations across the country because he discovered America. <laughs> you see? And, uh, and by the way, he was a half conservative, half Orthodox type guy. I mean, he, was, he was a man of the middle, but he knew the sociology that he was speaking about, okay? Now, um, it's kind of interesting. All this starts, as I said before, in there. Hasidism does not locate itself like the Amish in central Pennsylvania. They don't, they, they, maybe people could understand that. The Satan Rebbe will move, you know, to the Amish country or some equivalent thereof, set up his own little area, what you would call today square town, written big. No, the Hasidim all locate themselves in Manhattan, in adjacent Manhattan, the epicenter of modernity. Think about that. All these Hungarian, Yiddish-speaking Hasidim will, will come in and set up yeshivas and schools and base ruchels and all the rest of it, not that far away from Wall Street, not that far away from Greenwich Village, not that far away from the very center of Western creativity, which is, of course, moving to the left as 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And they're not aware, or they choose not to be aware, that a few blocks away, an entirely different phenomenon. Is, is, it's fascinating as a piece of American history Forget the Jewish. It's fascinating as a piece of American history that's a profound culture, cult, countercultural trend is developing. The only thing is today, since the numbers have gotten big enough, so they noticed it. You see, but it was going on as it began in the 1950s. Um, now, by the way, the Hasidim are not in principle opposed to moving to the Amish country. I mean, you do have this. Curious, yo, right? Where you have like, look at this. You know, be sure you're wearing long skirts and pants and, and so forth and so on. At the elbow, use appropriate language, maintain gender separation in public areas. I mean, you know, you do have the Amish country over there. Um, but that's, but most of them don't live there. Most of them live in New York City, as you know, in the New York City metropolitan area. How does Hasidism do this? Very briefly, in the context of what we're talking about tonight, by laser-like corporatism. From the day the Satmar Rebbe comes in here, every penny from every house is going into Satmar. And they keep pouring money into the business, so to speak, right? And if you're Lubavitch, same thing, you know, all, Lubavitch born, Lubavitch bred, and when you die, Lubavitch dead. Everything's going to be in the company. And same thing for, for Bells and for Vishnitz and this and that and the other, right? You keep everything very local. You develop your institutions. You pour the money into the schools, into the kolos, into the other organization, to the, to the uh, what should I say, the charitable groups and all the rest of it. You do that for 30 years, and you get something, <laughs> right? You get something. And so um, they create the only actual kahillas in America, as far as I'm concerned. Where do you have a kihila in the old-fashioned European sense? in anywhere, but certainly in, in North America. With a group like Sommer, with a group like Vishnitz, with a group like, uh, you know, uh, Klosenberg or something like that, where you have a, 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 a Rav and a Bezdin, and you pay your taxes to the kill over there, they do it. I mean, you know, it's not legally enforceable, but social pressure, it happens. And all these things go to run, and they have their own cemetery, and they have their own cover condition, they have their own, as you all know, Bikr Cholim, and they have everything in there, all run in a Kehillah type fashion. And the reason you can do this is, it's Eisenhower's America. It's freedom of religion for everybody. Just everybody should be religious. It's interesting. Okay? Now, uh, the second Haredi trend is not Hasidic at all. The iconic representation I'm talking about is Ravon Cutler and Lakewood. Here's a very rare picture of a video of Ravon Cutler at a wedding. I think the Vishnitz Rebbe or somebody that goes to the wedding. There's a barn. Okay? Uh, by 1952, the, what they call the yeshiva world, which never existed before, is a part of the American reality for the first time in American history. Okay? Uh, people like this start to get traction. It's Rabbi Rudabin, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, Rabbi Akhtan Esri, Rabbi Gifter, and the others like that, Rabbi Hudner, and all, how many people can fit on the screen. But the point is that these are, what's interesting is not that they're there or they come to America or all the rest of it. The interesting is they get traction. You know what I'm saying? That's the key, key part over there. I'll show you something over here. It's a long piece. I'll show you just like a half a minute or something like that. This is from a Camp Agoda or whatever. You show it? 
It was a Moshe Feinstein, I think. I can't see so well from my, my angle. Rabbi Ruderman, and I think that's Rabbi Sarutskin from uh, Tells and so forth. You know, many of you will recognize the picture. What did the Marshall Sclairs fa fail to notice in this uh, uh, video, in these sorts of scenes? They say, here's a bunch of old guys that don't talk English and are really uh, out of it and all the rest of it. And so what are all the kids there? <laughs> right? You don't usually see people in the 60s and 70s surrounded by kids. They didn't see that, right? They, they focus on the old part, <laughs> right? What, what is Camp Agudo? You know, what are the other guys? What, what are young people doing wanting to spend time around people in their 60s and 70s? You don't find that in America. Well, and later on when they hit their 80s and 90s, right? What, what is it? That's a question they didn't ask themselves because they didn't get it. Because if you're, you're out of the loop culturally, you just don't get it. And so um, the result is that there occurs over here, starting in the early 50s, late 40s, early 50s, a, a really countercultural revolution among American Jews, or, or, or a tiny segment at least, of American Jewry, um, which in the Brandeis way offers different a, a possibilities. There's Rabbi Aaron Kotler and the rejection of college. Because Lakewood became synonymous, especially in the 50s and afterwards, with the idea, oh, it's very bad to go to college. Don't do that. Just sit and learn, and, and, and afterwards you do something else. You either become a rabbi, become a rabbi, or this, or go get a job. College is bad news. Which is treason to Eisenhower's America. You know, in, in America, you go to college. That's how Jews get ahead. The immigrants got off the boat. They had to work in the sweatshop. They put their kids through city college. The kids moved them here. Next generation become doctors. And then their generation comes even better. It doesn't get better. And here somebody said the, the whole model of college and everything associated with it is one and this should be rejected. And that appeals to many. Then on the other hand, if you wish to, you can get the opposite if you want. You can get Rabbi Salvation who embraces college. So you, have, you can have it either way. And Rabbi Salvation is a great gaon. You don't need me to tell you that. And he's obviously the head of Yeshiva University. Right? And besides the fact he himself has a college degree and everything associated. So if you like the idea of rejecting college, you got where to go. And if you like the idea of embracing college, you got to go. And if you're in the middle, you got this. <laughs> in Baltimore, we call it near Israel. What's the story with college? Well, you know, it's not good. It's not, man, you, know, you can go, but then whatever. Daf Machan 11, you know, all the rest of it, but it shouldn't be a hicker. Yeah, however you want to say. Don't you understand? This Brandeis would, Brandeis would applaud. Because what you're doing is you're letting a thousand flowers bloom and see which one takes off. And, it, and some models will work for some, and some models will work for others. And the result is you get ultimately the most efficient production system in which you'll get this type, you get this type, you get that type. Everybody has a way to do it. And at the same time, embracing Haredi Judaism, right? Or Torah Judaism. Uh, historically speaking, these people are successful. Huh? People are Ron Cutler, or Rudiman, all the rest of it, they're successful because <clears throat> they realize uh, that it's all about education. Don't worry about anything else. You concentrate on education. I know, anybody know the Greek? <laughs> the fox knows many things, Hedge knows the others, Poilia, Olympics, the Kinos and Mega, Hey Mega, the one big thing, right? The, um, the, the, the point though is that that was true thousands of years ago, and it's true today. You want to make a big Roshem somewhere? You want to make success? Define your mission. Remember, we heard this, this is the problem of Vietnam. Define your mission. Don't get led into side roads. Stay on the task and see it through. Right? Don't get into arguments about kashrus and don't get into arguments about college. And don't get, eh, stay, stay the course. And not only higher education. 1952 and 1956, among other things, are the heroic years of Tehran Misero. Right? Anybody remember Rabbi Kamenetsky, Dr. Joe Kamenetsky? If you had anything to do with schools across the United States, including Baltimore, but particularly if you're out of town, what do I say heroic years? Him and his colleagues, they set up the term Soros uh, um, uh, organization. They went across the state to state and they went from town to town. And if you want the late 40s and throughout the 50s and early 60s, they're having meetings in, this, uh, in Buffalo and in Minneapolis and then San Francisco and in Seattle and in Tucson and Topeka and Houston. And, you know, just go, do, go down the names. And you, next week, you come back for the second meeting in Winnipeg. And then you have the meeting in Florida and all the rest of it. It's, it's, it's uh, 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 let's put it this rigorous work. It, it's exhausting work. But you get Paris. Because you're surprised. You go to Memphis, you say, Memphis, Tennessee is never going to. Not true. You go to Atlanta, nothing's going to happen in a place like that. Not true. You go across the country, 
right? I mean, I know I see people in the audience that we're part of what I'm talking about, and uh, it's a revolution. So by the time they're finished, you have 90,000 Jewish kids in day schools. Uh, out of a Jewish population of 5 million, or a little more than 5 million, 90,000 is not big, but it's not tiny either. It's not 9,000. You see? And this cannot help but create, in the long term, a demographic revolution. You see? Now, I want to be very clear over here. Of the 90,000, it's probably more likely that 9,000 will end up in yeshivas and high schools. Let's not fool ourselves. Just because someone goes to a day school in, you know, here and there and elsewhere, especially when the school's up to the sixth grade or something like that, and afterwards they're going to public school, it's pretty much a bracha of atola. But 10% or 20% will, will not be. And that 20% will eventually have another 10 and 20%, you know, with, with their kids. And like I say, the hedgehog knows one great thing. Okay? I mean, he's a perfect example. What, what did he do his whole life? One great object. Right? You don't get involved in politics about Israel. You don't get involved about the OU. You don't get involved about all the rest of it. The only thing you care about is the school in Scranton. Right? The school in, in Canton. <laughs> right? The school, you know, in Louisville. If they, and we'll try again to make one. The school in Phoenix. The school in Seattle. Which is another thing. The other movements didn't do this. So it's like the tortoise and the hare. They could have done it. But that's not the culture that they were comfortable with, and that's not what they chose to do, and the results are what they are. Now, um, uh, uh, by the way, not only male education either. I mean, I, I, I oh, good, he found it. Right, like this again. Um, I asked him, said the young, uh, well, I really should get a picture from the 50s, you know? When, when did the Beit Yaakov have its first graduating class in Baltimore, Maryland, the high school? Around 57, 58, these years. In other words, the years 1952 to 56 is when they launched the high school. You understand? You see, now these are things that aren't picked up by the Marshall Squares. You know, they're not sexy, so to speak. They're not big items to get on the front pages and all the rest of it. Uh, but they're the real demographic reality, right? Uh, just, I mean, I don't need to say this to an audience like this. Consider Baltimore, Maryland, and the impact of Beis Yaakov yeah, in the last 50 years or whatever it is. Okay? You know, so uh, all this stuff is coming together, as they say, in these years which turn out not to be uninteresting and boring years altogether. They're years whose significance, I argue tonight, is underappreciated, right? undervalued. As a result, there was created a very small segment of American-born Jewry, I repeat, American-born Jewry, who would be very different from the overwhelming majority of American Jewry, particularly the youth. It was the beginning of the bifurcation of American Jewry into two. Not we are one, but we are two. This is a rather more accurate description of American Jewish sociology than the ones the federations and the Jewish establishment um, pushed. It's, it's a reality that the federations and the Jewish establishment has only uh, reluctantly acknowledged in the last quarter century or so. Well, before that, it didn't exist in their minds. In the last 20 years, 25 years, uh, all of a sudden, the Orthodox are, you know, are there and uh, associates of federations and the other similar groups are scrambling how to uh, work in, in that kind of environment. You understand? Because it's so radically different than the others. This group wants to take a very clear stand, for example, on gay marriage. And this group does not. They have a different point of view. Right? This group wants to make a big and clear statement, I don't know, uh, that Israel should give up a territory or something like that, because that's the way it goes. And this group doesn't feel that way. And what do you do? And especially, Baltimore is not exactly a typical case, as I said before. Here, uh, 20 years ago, the firm was 20%. Then uh, 10 years ago, it was 25%. Now, the last poll a few years ago was 33%. It's getting out of hand. <laughs> you understand? Well, 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 you can laugh, but I can guarantee you downtown on Mount Roseway, that's what's happening in, in behind closed doors. It's getting out of hand. What do you do? Can't shoot them. What do you do? <laughs> right? Well, well, well where, where is it going? Okay, so um, this creates an American Jewry of a very unusual character, which is different than Jewish communities anywhere else in the world. I repeat, different than Jewish communities anywhere else in the world. You're talking about two separate religious universes, obviously. I repeat, two separate religious universes. You're talking about two text universes. Okay, look at this. Here's, is, is this a, a video? It's a Yomi. Yeah, you get 100,000 people for a dafiomi, and then you have another segment of American Jewry that never heard they think it's a Japanese food. <laughs> and they literally do, but they don't know what the word means. And if you told them, they'd be scratching their heads. So people read this stuff, 
And second of all, 100,000 100, people go together in the Meadowlands to celebrate the young people? You know, like, what, what, they don't get it. You see? It's, it's two text universes. The other guys are reading different books. Even those who are interested in Jewish culture are reading different Jewish books. Very good. I mean, how have I? That's decreasing also. But, uh, you know, they're reading uh, Philip Roth or something like that, right? The Dafiomi, as I said before, it's a Japanese food. The, um, it's two social universes. And so, for example, in Baltimore, Maryland, there's a whole social life, uh, of which this is a tiny segment, which affects, this is sad, but it's true, uh, which affects one segment of the community. They go to the same, uh, you know, uh, social events and uh, wedding events and uh, the speeches and this and that and the other. And then the other segment of the community goes to their set. Just the two never come together. You can't find, as far as I can think, any kind of activity which brings significant members of both communities to the same activity. And that's true, and that's true. She says, Beth Fila, how have I? I tried to do Beth Fila, we didn't get it. To a, a tiny degree, I mean, it, yes. To a tiny degree, yes, but only to a very tiny degree. Um, the vast majority of the from community, is it called the last community? The non from community? Nothing to do. It's like two people living in parallel universes. Um, all this starts very small. Oh, by the way, it's, a, it's an intellectual, two different cultures. I mean, you go into one set of houses, you see 100 Hebrew books. You go into another set of houses, they can read Hebrew. You understand? You get one set of houses, and the, 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 the type of printing press that are there are names that others have never heard of. You know, Masora and Feldheim and all this, and the others have never, never heard of it. Okay? And to be perfectly honest, in the last 25 years or so, 20, 25 years, the um, culture, the Jewish culture, of the other group disintegrating. Um, for example, the Jewish Publication Society just kicked the bucket. For example, yeah, the, for example, uh, the Baltimore Hebrew College has literally been turned by the Associated into a parking lot. Okay? And the library, which was once a used resource, is gone. How would it, it's a euthanasia. They said to put it into uh, Towson University. <laughs> but, but it's gone. It's uh, meaning they can't hold their own. I'm talking at the cultural level. It's, it's quite a bifurcation that I'm talking about. And it goes back if you want to get down historically to the early 50s. Um, it starts very small, this trauma. I'm talking in the decade following World War II. Within orthodoxy, the years 52 to 56 see the crystallization of a complete shift in, a, in gravity and authority from the rabbinate to the Rosh Hashivas for the first time ever. Okay? And so uh, power goes to people like this, and it goes away from a very young Rabbi Lamb and Emmanuel Rackman, who years before would have been the big machers and the spokesmen and the talkers for the totality of American Orthodox Judaism and would have been the official spokesman. But rabbis go into deep uh, delegitimation in the, starting in the 50s. It, maybe you know this, maybe you don't know this. The feeling among the increasing numbers of the young, the ones who are Shomer Shabbos and care, is that the only real Orthodox Judaism is in the yeshivas. The rabbis are sellouts. Because look at the show. They don't have a small machitza, everybody drives, nobody really keeps anything, the rabbi can't can make him do anything, he's barely uh, holding on, he has to uh, violate uh, this law and that law in order to keep his job, all the rest of it. It's a sellout. You, you alienate, you keep the middle demographic, but the religious kids, with the youth of the future, uh, ew, who wants to get smicha and become a synagogue rabbi and deal with a lousy balabatim? This is the universal attitude of the yeshivas in the 1950s and 60s and even in the 70s. So people who are old enough will remember, will, will know what I'm talking about. You know, if somebody gets a smicha, it's just a purely academic sort of thing, um, better go be an accountant. Go become a lawyer. Or if you want to go into something real, go into chinuch or whatever. Why would you want to get involved in a modern Orthodox synagogue where nobody's ever going to listen to you? You could be looked upon weird, but the fact that you ask them to keep Shabbos or tell them not to drive, or uh, that, that, that you ask somebody not to turn on the lights, they think you're crazy. Why do you want to spend your life doing that? You understand? So you see, within the Orthodoxy, it's a, it's a break, it's a bifurcation. Even the knowledgeable rabbis, starting in the 50s, are now viewed as unreliable and anemic sellouts whose rulings are not sound and reliable, even though they could be big scholars. Best example I'm talking about, look at Rabbi Polakoff and Rabbi Simcha Levi. These were big, I know Rabbi Polakoff is from Baltimore, and have relatives here and all the rest of it. These were big machers in the early 50s in the RCA, Rabbinical Council of America, which was the YU organization. I'm sure many of you, perhaps hopefully everybody here is heard of the Rabbinical Council of America. In the early 1950s, they had a halacha commission. Rabbi Simcha Levi was the uh, main guy in the, from Perth Amboy. He was there for 30, 40 years. He's a big Talmud Chacham. He has a safer of Shalos and Shubas, all the rest of it. 
they came out. I mean, this would be very interesting for the show that I'm in at this very moment. You'll appreciate this. They came out in 1951 that the microphone is fine. Okay? Um, and they can prove it. They have all the halachic sources, all the rest of it. Ramosha finds he said it's not. That's it. Because the young people are like this. These rabbis aren't real rabbis. Yeah, they're rabbis of shuls in which people aren't religious and this and that. That's, that's got nothing to do objectively with their level of scholarship. I mean, Rabbi Palka, for example, was nine years in Tells. I'm not talking about Cleveland, I'm talking about Tells. <laughs> okay? And Rabbi Levy also went, was, in, was in Poland and Eastern Europe and Big Yeshiva was on Yosef Engel before he came to YU and graduated in 1921. Doesn't matter. Not to the young. You see? And therefore, if he said the microphone is Michal Shabbos, that's the end of it. There are people who are old enough to remember that there were big fights all through the 1950s and 60s in all the Alman Rosak precisely over the question of microphone. When I was a kid, every shul outside the Glen Avenue shul, every shul had a mic. Right? And nobody knew exactly why, because not everybody remembered, you know, this sort of thing that I just described over here, and that the RC Halacha Commission one time planned it is good. Uh, it wouldn't have mattered. And you could show him, Rabbi Polakov wrote years and years, I'm sure some people know this, he used to write in the Noam and the Tradition Magazine and others, making the case, that where, tell me what I'm doing, what I'm saying wrong, all the rest of it. He didn't get any uh, attention even. It's irrelevant, because it's the culture that I'm talking about up here. And the culture is the Russian Shivas know, the others don't know. And the proof is, go in the four walls of the yeshiva, you see Judaism fully practiced. Go in the synagogues of all these rabbis, you see Judaism not practiced. So why should I be interested in their opinion? That's the, what the young people are saying. And this is a powerful sociological trend that starts in the early 50s and goes over there. All those unread forum of old rabbis gathering dust in the Hebrew College Library of my youth. You know, this big rabbi from St. Louis and that rabbi from Omaha and this rabbi from over here. Books of great scholarship perhaps, nobody's interested in them because their own uh, generation, you know, the middle demographic can't read Hebrew. And the boys in the yeshiva are interested in the, the Rosh Hashiva books. They're not interested in books of these guys, because after all, who's interested in what some rabbi in Toronto said over here, when we know his own kids weren't religious, and his own shul had people driving, and this and that and the other. That's the attitude, right? So it has nothing to do with the pure intellectualism of it, with the, how shall I say, the legalistic strength of the arguments, all the rest of it. It's got to do with what I'm talking about over here. Even the, um, it, it, I'm really describing the sociology of halachic charisma. True? The sociology of halachic charisma. The um, fact of the matter is that uh, even the Agudas Rabbonim, which is the famous organization of all the old, white-bearded, Yiddish-speaking rabbis from Europe, begins this descent into absolute irrelevance during this period. The only group to whom they would possibly be relevant, after all, is the yeshiva students and graduates. And those guys are only interested in what Byron Cutler and the other Russian yeshivas have to say. And so famous names from the past are unknown today. You've heard of Rabbi Lezer Silver f f because he was a character the second brother wrote a book about him. Okay, so uh, in this public, maybe, you, maybe you've heard about him. Uh, we saw Rosenberg, when Rabbi Weinberg and the Rizzo got married, who's the Masada Kedushin? We saw Rosenberg. Why, they had to go to Trump money. Those are sort of prestigious. Nobody's even heard of him. There, but Rabbi Convitz, and maybe people heard of his son, the law professor, Rabbi Yosef Convitz, was the son of the son of the Ridvaz, a big Talmud Chacham, the rabbi of uh, Newark. Uh, what's Newark? Today you call it West Orange. He said, but you know, it's a. Uh, <laughs> you get it. Nobody cared anymore. The non-religious or non-yeshiva guys couldn't read and didn't care anyway. And the young public is an interest in what they have to say. They're interested in what the yeshivas have to say. Um, as a result, most of Orthodox Judaism, all of it actually, goes to the right. The iconic representation on Talmud is a 1956 ban on joining mixed um, organizations issued by the Rosh Hashivas. I'm sure many know that in 1956, Ryan Cutler and a whole bunch of other people, I'll explain in a minute, came out and they said, I guess it's us to belong to any kind of organization if, 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 which involves non-Orthodox. Okay? I don't shoot them, but uh, you can't be on a, on a, like for example, the Baltimore Board of Rabbis, something like this. If it has Orthodox, considering wrong, you can't have that. Because that's some kind of a legitimation of the others. Nobody said that before. Where'd that come? But, but, but it will come as a rule. It's actually very, very interesting. And this will be the last big issue I deal with tonight. The, um, this was directed mainly at the fears that the modern Orthodox and the conservative are getting too chummy. The background of this is the Aguna problem. The Aguna problem, right? Um, it's very fascinating. I could devote a whole lecture just to this, but I'm going to sum it up very briefly. We all know in Judaism, one of the big problems is it's too easy to get married and too hard to get divorced. Right? It's too easy to get married. In Hawaii, all you need is a guy and a girl and a, and, and a, and a, a small amount of money and two witnesses. And, you're in. and it's too hard to get divorced because only the guy can get the divorce, and if he holds it up, then it can make all kinds of issues. And so what do you do about it? 
In the, starting in the 1880s in France, because the French government prohibited um, religious uh, marriages and divorces, they want everything to be secular. This is part of the battle in France between the right and the left. So the French rabbis freaked out and they said, we, then all divorces should be uh, secular. I would about uh, getting and Kedushin, write a Tanai in at the time of the Kedushin that if the French state says it's no good, then whatever, halachically, however it works, it should be uh, considered canceled. Um, and the, the French rabbis were not Talmud Chacham at all, they're Bing Amaratim, but they wanted to you know, get along with the French uh, culture, let's put it that way. However, this is the old world, this is the world before bifurcation kicked in, and at that time in 1886, so uh, people complained about it, and the chief rabbi of France, uh, yeah, this guy, uh, Tzadok Khan, who was uh, close with Cedar Herzl actually, chief rabbi of France said like this, look, I don't know, I'm going to write to the big rabbi, the covenant of Bishop Claude Spector, in those days, you still had a traditionalist world in, in which people, even if they're not particularly observant all the rest of it, but at a certain Derek Harris, there's a kind of authority that doesn't exist today, where people who are not religious, shall put it that way, but when it comes to Jewish matters, you know, he's the one to, to, to turn to because he was, he, although nobody really knew him very well, but somehow or other he had a magnetic reputation and people said, he's like a barrier, man. He's, if he says it, that's it. And the Kovner Rav wrote them a very diplomatic letter because that's who he was, and he said, this is not a good idea. And so they, they, it, it didn't happen. And um, this happened in 1886, 1993. And in France in 1907, and in Istanbul in 1924, there were attempts to redo this. At that time, the Kovner Rav was dead, or instead you had uh, the famous Rabbi Chaim Grzynski, who did not have that kind of authority at all. Chaim Grzynski is more associated with the Agoda types. Already there was a Agoda versus the Mizrahi, and his own community didn't vote him in as the chief rabbi of Vilna. So it was a different sort of thing. And so now you have somebody who has tremendous power among the Rabbonim, but not among the, 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 the masses, as it were. Uh, and uh, what happened was that he, or, he got together all the rabbis in the world, from Germany and from France and from uh, Russia and you know, whatever it was, and they put out a thing called Ain't Tanai Ben Asuin, that this uh, proposal is not flyable according to Halacha. And it didn't happen, again, okay? Uh, in 1929, Rav Henkin, of course, everybody remembers the famous Gon Rav Henkin, he came up with a proposal that he said, if you write a Tanai in this and this way, that could also solve the problem of the Aguna because it'll retroactively kill the marriage or something along those lines. And, uh, and, and Rav Chaim Eisenhower said, oh, don't do that. He said, I, I, I withdraw. He said, I just want to pay. If you think it's not a good idea, Hadri B. He said, forget it, okay? And so this was obviously in the water. In 1935, Louis Epstein, a very famous uh, uh, conservative rabbi who had been in Slobodka. <laughs> this is when you had rabbis who, who, who emigrated to America and went to the JTS after they had been in Yeshiva in Lithuania. So Louis Epstein came up with what they called the Epstein proposal, in which the husband under the Kedusha, if I remember correctly, appoints the wife as a shliach to do the get if it ever happens, and that way you don't need his consent. It's very complicated. When I say it's complicated, I, I genuinely mean the halachas of it are complicated. I can't go through it over here. And once again, oh my goodness, all hell broke loose. Rokhaim Rezegrzynski was still alive. The Agudas Rabban Rabbi Convitz declared war, and it didn't happen. Okay? It was big fights. But I'm still speaking about a traditional world when people, which A, cares about what B says. And uh, in 1952 to 56, these are the years of the Lieberman proposal, when the famous uh, conservative uh, scholar, he wasn't exactly conservative, Saul Lieberman, who was a big professor in the Jewish Theological Seminary, who was a much firmer guy than the people we said before, um, he came up with this idea also to, to, that um, when, they get, when, when everybody gets married, you should say that if there are any issues, you submit it to such and such a basin, a conservative basin, and they will be able to uh, uh, penalize Legally, the husband, if he doesn't give the get, you know, something along those lines. And at that time, uh, Rabbi Salvation and him were personal friends. And uh, I'll say it again, Rabbi Salvation and him were personal friends, even though they didn't agree on the conservative ideology. Believe me, in the 50s, that's when Rabbi Salvation was the lion against conservative. He said that maybe some people are old enough to remember, he used to take out an ad in the papers every year, Rabbi Salvation, to say it like this. And this is important in Eastern European Jewish culture. Don't go to shul and hear the chauffeur if the only shul is conservative. That's, that's a big statement to say to, one, to, to, to an Eastern European lady or man. He said, you don't go to the show because part of their life, again, everybody knows, is, is the folk culture. Well, Rosh Hashanah got here to show for it. Right? And he said, but conservative, don't do it. So there's no question about the ideological difference between the two of them, but they're trying to figure maybe we can do something to help the Agona situation. And so the result is that they have secret meetings, and it's a whole long business. They, they would have both agreed to appoint a certain basin. All the members of the basin, by the way, that was projected on the plan were going to be orthodox. But it's complicated. And in the result of all this, 
uh, oh my goodness, you know, uh, rumors get out and people say it, it, it's the commingling, as it were, of the conservative and the orthodox. Uh, Saul Lieberman was the first cousin of the Chazanish. Right? First cousin of the Chazanish. And he ex represents the extreme right wing of the conservative movement, though he maintains a hands off stance in regards to rabbinical issues, driving and so the rest of it. And he's an academic in the Jewish Theological Seminary. He wasn't involving himself, as he put it, in the day-to-day -day stuff. But he very much wants to establish a Keshe with the Orthodox when it comes to Chuppah Kedushin and Mamzerim, because that's a different thing. In other words, you want to eat tray? That's one business. You want to drive the show? Whatever. Marriage and divorce in Judaism? That's, that's, that's a, you know, a, a, a higher level of, of difficulty. If, if someone gets married without a get and the children are illegitimate, I mean, that's, that's a whole can of worms you don't want to touch. It's a very traditional way of looking at it. Everything I'm talking about, the conservative movies, we'll move way past this by today. But I'm talking about it at that time. And so, um, with the decline and death of Louis Ginsburg, and Lieberman was much more from than Ginsburg, uh, he's the greatest Talmud and, and, and rabbinic scholar in the conservative movement. They definitely want to hold on to him. And as I told you before, he was very close and good friends with Rabbi Soloveitchik, and there are secret ne negotiations between Lieberman and Soloveitchik over joint based in. But in the end, it doesn't quite work. The conservative movement rejects it. They don't feel comfortable with it. Because then it would do something that's tied down to orthodoxy. The, uh, but the yeshiva world, and the Godes Rabbanim goes ballistic. Any kind of cooperation with the conservative movement uh, in 1955, I mean, you're crazy that horse left the barn uh, 100 years ago, right? You know, with the, uh, with, with the fundamentalism and non-fundamentalism issue. On the other hand, there's, another part, there's the other part of orthodoxy, the modern orthodox, the YU world, which by this time is crystallized into the RCA, and Rabbi Salvechik is the POSIC in the middle of the 1950s. How do they feel towards cooperation in any form with the conservatives? There is most definitely a left wing in the RCA, which wants to maintain whatever bonds are possible with the conservative movement for a variety of reasons. That would especially be Rabbi Rackman and Lukstein. They just, they're still grounded in the idea that conservatives just a little, they're going a little bit too far, but one day we can bring them back in. That's one group. On the other hand, there's a right wing in the RCA who wants to go in the opposite direction. In 1954, the leading right winger in the RCA is elected as president of the RCA, a uh, famous rabbi, David Hollander. Some people remember him from the past. He was a big rabbi in, in New York. Um, and uh, Rabbi Hollander, who happens to be the brother-in-law of Moshe Sher, by the way, from the Agoda, deplores the left wing trend and the secret negotiations with Lieberman. And in general, conservative Jews should be exposed for what it is. That's his point of view. Hollander, Rabbi Pelkowitz from the Igud, uh, solicitor Byron Cutler to come out he and his colleagues against any kind of a cooperation with the conservative reform, and the Rosh Hashivas do this in 1956. And you can say we've been asked by a number of rabbis and alumni about New York Board of Rabbis, similar groups, come reform with Sir Rabbi, having gathered together, we say no. I mean, that's, uh, that's what the words boil down to. Now, they have no authority. Uh, who appointed them? They're just a bunch of Rosh Hashivas. They got the traction. So I just explained to you the, the young are going to listen to them. Right? This is the way it's supposed to go. Rabbi Salvation did not go along with this. That doesn't matter. You know Rabbi Salvation a little bit too, too much college. Uh, it's, it's a, the, no, uh, you see how the culture develops. Um, how, let me put it this way. The RCA didn't go along with him. Um, there's Rabbi David Lipschitz, Rabbi Salvation. Rabbi Salvation said, uh, I don't hold by this. Rabbi David Lipschitz voted for it. He was one of the people who signed the 1956 ban. See, even with the ranks of the RCA and NYU, there's a split, as you see. The left and the OU don't listen. Those are old enough to remember that every time they had OU convention, in my memory, in Baltimore, Maryland, Robert Rudman couldn't go and speak to them. And Robert Weinberg, because he said they're not listening to the Psaka, the Russia Shivas in 1956 to separate from the other organizations because they're members of joint organizations. In general, the trend, the direction of American orthodoxy is clear, it's to the right. At the same time, the direction of non orthodox is to the left. And so, in conclusion, by 1956, the central cultural trend of our lives, the central cultural trend of American Jewry, the simultaneous and contemporary development of two segments of American Jewry in opposite directions, the tale of two cities, is a trend which crystallizes in the year 1952-56, I would argue, and which, as we have all experienced, has played out